So Edgar Austin Middlehouse was born in British Guyana exactly 105 years ago today, on the 16th of December, 1909. He was to become the first of the Caribbean literati to be awarded the esteemed Guckenheim Fellowship, and indeed to make a professional career out of writing novels. Several of his 22 novels, his first published in 1941, his last posthumously in 19. 65, actually, Roger, you mind just... So you can see there the list of um, all of the novels he wrote and read. Um, so several of his novels were published into at least six different uh, European languages, with his most universally respected novel, A Morning at the Office, being published by Penguin. Other published works include an anti-capitalist novella, a travel journal, an autobiography, numerous articles, short stories, and poems. According to A.J. Seymour, Middlehouse was known at the height of his career to millions of English-speaking people across the world. And I can attest to that because I can remember uh, visiting a family in Ghana, and, they actually, and this was a while ago, uh, as a child, and they had a copy of the Kwana trilogy. Um, although it didn't strike me at the time, obviously. But, um, and his literary agent revealed that his books sold thousands of copies and were considered to be the hottest sellers in the paperback market. There is little doubt that at the beginning of his career, Middlehouse's novels stood out as refreshingly different from his contemporaries in the West. On 24th May 1941, a Times literary supplement reviewer made the following remark about his published novel, A Quarantine Thunder. There is an odd beauty in this book and a haunting pathos. Even more typical in terms of the adjectives used to describe Middlehouse's novels was a review written by the well-known New York Times writer Orville Prescott in September 1951. The most original, the most peculiar, and in some ways the most diverting novel I have read this year is Shadows Move Among Them by Edgar Middlehauser. This beautifully written, subtle, and intellectually challenging novel defies classification. It is a satire, a farce, and a fantasy, and also a study of a utopian society. It is extremely clever, deliciously comic, and occasionally quite grisly. Hyperbole aside, Mose agreed, at least in the first half of his career, that he was an accomplished novelist, with a tireless and entertaining imagination, a writer who was genuinely versatile, experimental, and intriguing. It was not uncommon, furthermore, to see his name being favorably compared to other great writers. His novel, My Bones and My Flute, was, for instance, described in the Daily Telegraph as being equal to the novels written by Joseph Thomas Sheridan Le Fanu, the leading ghost story writer of the 19th century. His talent was hailed by The Observer, following the publication of his sixth novel, The Life and Death of Sylvia, as one of the most surprising to have appeared in English literature for 20 years. Privy to these facts alone, one might assume that Middlehouse's career had been a trouble-free, successful one. The reality is a lot more complex, and the aim of this paper is thus to outline some of the challenges that Middlehouse faced on account of his socio-historical context, and in so doing, make plain quite how extraordinary his achievements were. When Middlehauser made the radical decision in 1928, following the completion of his first serious story, The Dubloon, to become a professional novelist, he was thought by his colored middle-class counterparts in New Amsterdam to be verging on the lunatic. To use John Figueroa's words, Middlehauser was considered mad. He was a man who had decided to be a writer, and when he said it, it must have been really frightening to everyone else. Creative writing, as A.J. Seymour explained, was viewed by West Indians as the preserve of Americans or Europeans. Young colonials who thought otherwise were, apart from acting above their station, considered to be incapable of contributing anything new or noteworthy to the admired tradition of English literature. This view of the non-white colonial was indeed ubiquitous, as exemplified by George Bernard Shaw's response to Claude McKay's literary aspirations. Tell me, young man, 
Why do you want to write poetry? This is not your business. You should take up boxing like Jack Johnson, you know, not this sort of thing. Like most young men of similar background, Middlehouse was expected to take up a respectable position in the civil service. This he did, but not for long. Tired of the race, color, class hierarchy, he soon tells his superior, like Horace, in a morning at the office, to keep his blasted job. <laughs> After a series of false starts and rejections of approximately 15 novels, Middlehouse's first novel, Quarantine Thunder, was published. The long journey to success, without the emotional support of his family, had been mentally and physically draining. In the year prior to the novel's publication, Middlehauser had been living in Georgetown hand to mouth. Supplementing his meager diet of peanuts and chocolate with a cocktail of vitamins, whilst living in a cubicle, triangular in shape, the mere screened off section of a room for which he paid $3 a week. He recalled later in life, the reality at last, after the anguish of a thousand massacred dreams, I did not celebrate. The daily struggle merely to eat and to keep alive was too exigent. And in a letter that I recently discovered to a friend, um, it was written in 1941, he disclosed, life has given my heart a pretty rough time. If disappointments used to leave tangible physical scars on one's heart, my heart would be found to be nothing but one great blurred tough mass of calloused flesh. Patience and determination were evident strengths, for he was to wait another nine years before the publication of his second novel, A Morning at the Office. This can be primarily attributed to the prevailing conditions of the Second World War and post-war um, paper scarcity, labor shortages, and of course the, the uh, related tendency of publishers to work with established novelists um, during economically uncertain periods. 